if you're going into buying a park with park owned homes to, um, you know, really make sure you can get inside those to assess the condition. Um, but I would say another uh, big mistake that I see people make is not taking action, just kind of going into that analysis paralysis mode of, uh, you know, waiting to find out, is it the right market? Is it the right time? And I think the, the only thing to do is, uh, you know, put a stake in the ground. And after you've, um, you know, done as much analysis as you need to go in and uh, take that step and actually acquire real estate. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Todd Solzinger is a former Silicon Valley finance executive turned real estate investor and CEO of Blue Elm Investments, a private equity real estate firm currently focused on mobile home parks. Todd, I'm sorry, I can't even hardly read today. <laughs> Your apologies. Welcome to the show. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? Uh, well, I grew up in San Jose, California, uh, went to San Jose State University, jumped into a corporate finance career, spent a few years working in the UK uh, for uh, this one particular company, uh, came back here, uh, you know, continued to try to chase the Silicon Valley IPO dream and, uh, uh, you know, ended up kind of uh, over a multi-year period of time deciding I wanted to focus on real estate and uh, made a transition a couple of years ago out of my corporate finance role into working on real estate full time. I'm uh, putting together syndications and have uh, made a focus over the last couple of years focusing on mobile home parks. That's really, really intriguing. I mean, when I think of Silicon Valley finance executive, I don't think mobile home parks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a typical transition. I know. I know. Well, I did have, there is, it was it another uh, pretty big player in the mobile home park space by the name of Jefferson Lilly, mm -hmm. uh, who's uh, has his own fund and has a, has, has a great podcast. And he also had a tech background and made the transition into mobile home parks. And uh, uh, just through some, uh, you know, investigation research and connections that i had made and, and relationships I built as I was looking into what asset class to work with, uh, I it ended up kind of making my way to mobile home parks and it definitely wasn't where I uh, thought I would end up when I started. What are some things you did to get comfortable with that asset class? Um, well, it was uh, again, probably a couple of years of, of, of research, you know, reading books, listening to podcasts, uh, you know, learning about real estate in general, along with getting uh, educated on how to actually put together real estate syndications. Um, and then I uh, found some uh, early investors that I was working with that wanted to get involved in mobile home parks just because they had also heard about some of the benefits of that asset class. Uh, around that same time, I got connected with a mobile home park consulting company, also based here in California, that uh, consults on parks across the country. And they're a couple hours away from where I live. So uh, once I connected with them, but I knew I could bring my uh, got passion for real estate and finance background along with their expertise in the mobile home park business and merged those two together and just started talking to brokers and uh, looking for deals around the country and finally found my first parks uh, in Georgia a couple of years ago. That's, that's very, very interesting. Well, walk us through that first deal. What did that look like? Where is it now? What have been some things you've learned? Uh, yeah, so the the uh, parks that I bought, there were 71 spaces uh, across two parks about a mile from each other in a town called Milledgeville, Georgia. And, uh, you know, it took me, I would say, probably... Uh, you know, maybe eight or nine months to find those parks. I made offers on a couple different parks, uh, some that either didn't get accepted because I was outbid, uh, a couple other ones that fell through just uh, because, of, you know, through the due diligence, decided not to move forward and uh, actually found these parks through the MHP broker, one of the big nationwide uh, brokerage firms. And that's one thing interesting about the mobile home park space is there, you know, there's a few brokers that focus on mobile home parks, um, other commercial brokers that uh, might every now and then get a listing, even some residential brokers, oftentimes because it might be a mom and pop owner that just has a relationship with a, a local real estate agent and says, hey, can you list my park for me? Um, so a lot of different ways you, you can find parks. So um, I found these parks that they were, they had a kind of a great value add component because the uh, guy that had run the park hadn't raised rents in, well, he had claimed he had not raised rents in the 15 years that he had owned the park. 
So, uh, so rents were below market. Uh, there were some vacant spaces and some vacant homes. Um, we had the ability to get seller financing uh, to oh. purchase the park. So, uh, yeah. So there were just you know those those couple components that led us down the path that uh, had us go ahead and close on those. The first deal I put together. Yeah. Tell me some things you learned on that project. Um, well, so the the project, I mean, it was uh, you know the timing unfortunately wasn't great. We bought the park at the in September of 2019, and kind of we're just starting our turnaround process. One of the first things we had to do was all of the tenants were paying in cash because oh, wow. you know the owner may or may not have been claiming all of the <laughs> income that was coming in. Not sure, um, but those you know those records weren't clear, so we had to convert people over to uh, not paying in cash. So that that took a little bit of time. We had to uh, swap out managers. Uh, this kind of leading into 2020, and then the COVID hit. So you know, during that time, once the eviction courts were closed, it really did hamper our ability to, um, you know, get some of the uh, tenants that weren't paying out. Uh, some people's jobs were affected by the pandemic. Other ones took advantage of the situation that the courts were closed and they couldn't be evicted. Um, so that you know, things kind of slowed down in terms of our, our, our turnaround. Um, I think one one of the things that I learned through that process was we were able to get inside quite a few of the park owned homes. Uh, This park was 71 spaces, but it came with about 55 park owned homes. Mm. And uh, we, during the due diligence process, we weren't able to get inside every one of the homes. We had the seller uh, kind of sign a, a, a separate affidavit to say there's no significant structural electrical, uh, you know, roofing defects in the homes. And he happily signed it. Once we took over, we found out there was a lot more, uh, damage to the homes and, uh, you know, uh, kind of maintenance that needed to go to, 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 to the homes to get those really livable. And once we took over, a lot of the tents were like, Hey, this is like new companies here. Now we're going to start, you know, bringing to them all of our maintenance requests. So, um, so a big lesson learned there was to do, uh, you know, to really be able to make sure you can get inside all of the vacant park owned homes. And if you can't, that can you know, potentially be a deal killer. Right. Yeah, man. Those, uh, the, those types of things can eat you alive. You know, most of the time, Todd, you find that, you know, mobile home park owners don't want to own park owned homes, but yet yeah, you took down a park that was, you know, chock full of park owned homes. Are you actively trying to get out of that? Or is this the business model you want to implement? Uh, it's really the business model that, that we wanted to implement. And this was really from some of the guidance of this mobile home park consulting firm I worked with, who's been in the business for 15 plus years. And they really found that <clears throat> while there's more, you know, more kind of more brain damage, more headache potentially, and more work around uh, a situation where the park owns the home is because you have to take care of the maintenance. So kind of, you know, dealing with uh, you know, tenant calls, whatever goes on with uh, maintenance on a house that's similar similar to how you would if you owned a single family house or an apartment building. But if you have a good uh, on-site manager and maintenance team who can handle those, know how to kind of manage that tenant base as well as that kind of park, then oftentimes in certain markets, like the ones I'm in in Georgia, where the house rents are between, say, $500 and $600 in a market where the lot rents are $200. So you might be getting a three to four hundred dollars spread per month per house. So let's say you know even round down to an additional four thousand dollars a year. It's typically not going to cost four thousand dollars a year to maintain the home to you know deal with a uh, clogged toilets and you know changing light bulbs and uh, even additional turnover that's associated with uh, having park owned homes. So. It really does depend the kind of the business model you want to have. I know there's you know, a lot of park operators that really want to focus on uh, parks that only have t- uh, tenant-owned homes, or if they buy parks with park-owned homes, want to try to sell those to the tenants as soon as possible just to collect the lot rent. So you know, there's not there's pros and cons to to both models. Um, it really depends on what kind of uh, you know what kind of park you decide you want to run. Right. Yeah, that, that's that's absolutely intriguing. That sounds more when you have that many park owned homes, you would need more boots on the ground, I would assume. Yes, definitely. Like the, the parks in Georgia, we actually have a husband and wife team in the park that take care of um, both uh, kind of day-to-day management, showing units to tenants, collecting rents, um, as well as somebody who's kind of actively uh, doing a combination of tenant calls that come up for regular maintenance issues, or if somebody vacates a home, actually going in and doing those uh, turns on the unit and um, 
uh, sometimes if it's a uh, maybe a more difficult project, you might need to bring in a crew to uh, kind of do a bigger rehab that, um, you know, it seems like at the, at the high end, we've seen 10 or $12,000 if the, if the home is in really bad shape for us to get it ready for a tenant. Sometimes it might just be a couple thousand dollars if there's, uh, you know, maybe some walls that need to be repaired, potentially some floors that need to be replaced, uh, various things like that. So yeah, so definitely you've got to have, uh, you know, more people on site to be able to handle those maintenance issues. What's the deal that you have with the um, husband and wife team? Do they live on site? Do they get free rent? What's, I mean, how does that work? Yeah, so yeah, so they they live on site. They get free rent, and then we pay an, an hourly w- uh, wage to them for uh, the time they're spending working at the park. Wow, that's uh, that's really. I mean, that that's great. That's great, probably for them and for you. Really, in the end, what about? Uh, I mean, unit turns. I guess that would be another question I have. How often, with a park owned home, does do you have a, a you know tenant turnover? I would obviously it's more often than you would if it were just straight lot rent. But what's the what's the stickiness of the tenant? Uh, yeah, so that that would be definitely one of the advantages of a tenant owned home model. If somebody owns their home, they're likely to stay in that house. Uh, you know, even if lot rents increase because of the uh, cost of moving a house to a different park, if you can find a park with a vacant lot, could be three, four, five thousand dollars. So they're they're they are stickier. Um, uh, so you so you do have higher turnover. Um, you know we kind of build into our financial models a, a 10% vacancy rate. Um, uh, again, kind of like depending on the market, depending on the time frame, uh, you might see higher or lower numbers than that. We've seen that you know because of COVID and uh, the uh, eviction moratoriums that happened, um, it was really it's been kind of hard for us to gauge what a, an average is because we had uh, tenants that were. Uh, you know, staying in the park, some cases for over a year and not paying rent because they couldn't be evicted Um, in a normal market, you know, maybe they would have uh, started paying because they, you know, didn't want to be evicted and try to find another place to live, or they would have, you know, moved out as soon as they uh, knew they were going to be evicted. So, um, uh, so because I've owned my parks kind of, you know, maybe 80% of the time uh, during the pandemic, we haven't really seen good enough trends to be able to make an assessment of what that looks like. That's really, really intriguing. What do you see uh, your business looking like in the next 12 months? Uh, well, I uh, recently closed on a park in uh, Arkansas, northern Arkansas, in October last year. So uh, that was a, a park that's about 80% occupied, um, but still needs needs some cleanup um, uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, there's a lot, just kind of a lot of debris and, and mess around the park that needs to get cleaned up. Um, a lot of the homes haven't been maintained well through the through the years from uh, by the previous owners. So uh, we need to kind of go in and, and clean the park up, improve the reputation. And again, that's a um, it's it's a slow process. Like you know, every month making progress, getting vacant homes rehabbed. Um, uh, you know, trying to find new tenants for those homes, and then also slowly uh, trying to clean up the the look and feel of the park. So. That's going to be, uh, you know, a big project I'll work on, um, you know, over the next year to really stabilize that park and, and increase the occupancy. Um, and then, you know, outside of mobile home parks, I've been, you know, talking to my investors about different opportunities in um, uh, in the mortgage note space. Uh, invest, I've invested personally in mortgage note funds in the past, uh, and I'm looking into possibly putting together a fund around those because I think I've invested in those personally. Um, it's kind of a great asset class because it's um, kind of a more consistent, safer income, you know, less ups, upside potential, uh, but still something backed by real estate. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm looking into for the next year. Man, that's fantastic. I love that. I love what you've done. You know, you take an action, you've gone out, you've purchased several parks, you've uh, certainly earned your stripes early on so that, uh, you know, hopefully get those behind us. And, and um, you know, I, I love, uh, yeah, I just love what you've done so far in the mobile home park space and, you know, also keeping track of where you go also in the, mo- or in the mortgage uh, note space. So tons of fun, Todd. I've certainly enjoyed this. Let's jump into a final few questions here. What is one mistake you can help our listeners avoid and how would you avoid it? 
Um, uh, yeah, one mistake. I mean, I, I did mention in terms of it, like if you're going into buying a park with park owned homes to, um, you know, really make sure you can get inside those to assess the condition. Um, but I would say another uh, big mistake that I see people make is not taking action, just kind of going into that analysis paralysis mode of, uh, you know, waiting to find out, is it the right market? Is it the right time? And I think the, the only thing to do is, uh, you know, put a stake in the ground. And after you've, um, you know, done as much analysis as you need to go in and, uh, uh, take that step and actually acquire real estate. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. When it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now to make the world a better place? Uh, well, w- one thing I do pretty regularly is I, I, I volunteer for the with the Second Harvest Food Bank doing grocery deliveries. So they've got a great program where they, uh, you know, you know, be able to get uh, take donations from people to you know, uh, uh, to buy food for families that that can't afford it. Um, and they have a great program where you can volunteer to actually go to their site pick up a bunch of groceries and kind of go around town and make deliveries. So that's something I've been doing for a while. That's a lot of fun. That's awesome. I love it. Todd, if our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Well, my company name is Blue Elm Investments. That's Todd at blueelminvestments.com. So reach out there. I've got an investor club uh, link that you can click on if you want to find more about uh, passive investment opportunities. Uh, I was also part of a book collaboration last year called Success Habits of Super Achievers. And if you go to my website, there is a uh, download link to get a copy of the ebook. That is fantastic. Todd, thanks so much for your time today. I do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Awesome. 